I guess sometimes they sing to be heard or just to do it. Uh, found out today about some things, you know, people uh, where I work, they have a lot of people come in to uh, sing and entertain and do different things. We have, of course, our service, you know, we do a little service on Friday mornings with them. But I found out that uh, today that they have to pay, and they do pay, people to come in there to sing and do different things for them. And uh, I just don't know about all that, you know. When I guess people that don't sing for the Lord, they can do what they want, whatever. But when it comes to, when it comes to God, I sing because I'm happy. And I sing because I'm free. And what other reason is there? And if there's another motive besides that, it's wrong. And that's what I hear when I hear Kim sing. I hear the happiness and the freedom and the joy she has when she sings. And I hope and pray that all of us will have that. And I think we do. I think we have a, a church that uh, doesn't do anything for show. That we do it because we love the Lord. And that's a wonderful thing. You got your Bibles not? Go with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter number 4. Would you believe that the letter to the church at Galatia has a bit of a reference to the birth of Christ? You may not necessarily remember it. It's not the most recognized verse that we'll read tonight, but it actually does tie in together with the birth of Christ, and it makes some statements that I want us to look at tonight that I think are very important theologically, and, and as we understand God and His Word, I think this is a good night to get into some of this stuff just to kind of touch on some foundational things and to kind of nail home some doctrinal things and not major things but some things I think we need to understand but uh, in the fourth chapter Paul is writing about our inheritance and I want us to start reading around verse 4 and we'll read through verse 6 and we'll just take a look at those verses tonight Galatians 4 beginning with verse 4 if you got it say amen Bible says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might, be, or that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. God, we stand in your presence this evening, very thankful that we can. Lord, we thank you for the songs we've been able to sing together. We're thankful for the joy that we have, the fellowship we have one with another. And Lord, I feel like that's pretty unique. Uh, sometimes, I guess, uh, churches don't do much of that. We thank you that we have that here. And we pray tonight as we stand before your word that uh, you'll get us out of the way. You'll get our minds clear. You'll get our hearts ready to receive that which you have to say. Help us to see how important uh, these events are in these texts. I pray that you'll speak to us tonight and lead the lost to Christ and help those who are hurting. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. Thank you for standing with me. Fourth chapter, it, it talks about there in that fourth verse about the birth of Christ. Now, we could talk, and, and I know Christmas is, is a sneaking up on us very quickly, but I don't think there is enough time. You could preach on it a lot more than what we do in the Christmas season. But the birth of Christ is very, very significant in the Christian faith. It's very significant as it relates to doctrine. And I've said before that if the birth of Christ is not to be believed the way the Bible says it, then how can we believe the rest of the Bible? Because Jesus' death for us is based on the fact that he was born like the Bible says he was born. And Paul knew that. Now here, mind you, Paul is preaching and teaching probably around 40 years, 35, 40 years after Jesus' birth. Jesus has dead, crucified, resurrected. And Paul, writing to the Galatians, thought it's so important to go back and touch on this and tie some things together. So let's look at these few verses. I just want to pull out some things uh, that Paul says. Maybe you already know these. Uh, Jimmy probably does. And what I figured I might do is after I preach, I'm going to send them to Jimmy. I'm going to write them down, let Jimmy fix them, and then I'll preach them again a year later and see how much better they are. Amen? Does that work, Jimmy? That won't work. Okay. It probably will, but that's all right. But in verse 4, it starts out saying, But when the fullness of the time was come. I'm glad to know that God's got everything planned out. You go all the way back to the Old Testament, to the book of Genesis. He told us the Redeemer's coming. You go back into Genesis 49. He says, until Shiloh comes, the sword shall not depart. All throughout the Bible, we're told there's a plan. There's a plan from the very beginning, and that plan is to send 
the Redeemer, to send the Messiah, to send Shiloh, or whatever name you want to use. Isaiah called him Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, Emmanuel, whatever you want to call him, to promise to us Jesus. And God has a plan. And I think tonight we can learn something. God's plan for the birth of Christ came together perfectly in that Bethlehem that night. And you can look at all the events and see how God just orchestrated everything to work out like it did. And I think for you and I, we can take away from that that God is orchestrating our lives. Sometimes we think we're in control, don't we? But then the truth of it all, God has ultimate control. Now, I'll say this, even those who think that they don't believe in God, even those who think they will not acknowledge God, even those who think they're going to do what they want when they want how they want, God will have the final say-so. God is orchestrating the pieces of the chessboard. He is moving and placing things exactly where he wants them to be. Now, sometimes the chess pieces don't cooperate. Sometimes the chess pieces are stubborn. Sometimes they like to buck and kick and do their own thing. Well, God's got another way to get you exactly where he wants you to go. That's the wonderful thing I think about free will. God gives us a choice to choose our path, what we're going to do or not do, but he still has the ability to orchestrate it to work exactly like he wants it to work. In the fullness of the time, God said, everything is working like I needed it to. Now is the time. God's in control. Now, not just that, but it says in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. That is important. That is very important that we recognize and understand Jesus is the son of God. Now, when you begin to study Christian faiths, you'll see that some of them, one of them in particular, believes God has more than one son. Uh, there's one particular that teaches that Satan was also a son of God, just like Jesus was. One fell up, one fell down, and if we're good enough, we'll all get to be little gods one day. Well, that is not true. God had one son by birth. Now, there's a different type of sons and daughters that we are. We'll talk about that in a minute. He had one son by birth. His name is Jesus. Do we believe that? We better believe that. If we don't believe that, we're starting off with way on the bad wrong foot. God sent forth his son. There's a lot out there today that, uh, that want to give lip service, if you will, to Christianity, but will not commit to the statement that Jesus is the son of God. They'll say, well, Jesus was a good person, and, you know, most of Christianity I get along with, but, uh, you know, Jesus, we don't know what's sure about him. Folks, I'll tell you, Christianity believes that he is the only, the one Son of God. Not only that, God sent forth his Son. Now, look at the second part of that statement, made of a woman. There's two things about Jesus. He was all God, and he was what? All human. He was all man doesn't make sense does it? how can you have a hundred percent of both it doesn't mathematically look right but that's exactly what Jesus was he was is rather the son of God completely in power in authority now he wasn't created that's another important thing the Bible says if you look God sent him it didn't say God made him or God created him or God formed him or God did whatever Jesus has been since the beginning of time John 1 tells us that without him was nothing made by him was everything made in the beginning was the word his word with God word was God the word is Jesus Christ he's always been God didn't make him God sent him but now he sent him being fully God endowed with all the powers that God possesses as God he can do anything but yet he's also made of woman he is clothed in flesh he has human everything else he has human flesh human bones human DNA to some extent we don't understand all that necessarily but to look at him was to look at another human being from the first century Israel he probably don't look like the pictures I don't want to disappoint you when we get there he ain't going to be that long blonde haired fella <laughs> that you see in the pictures okay just probably not going to be but don't worry about it you'll know exactly who he is when you get there you know how You'll know him by the, the prints of the nails in his hands, amen? We'll know him because we'll hear that voice that's led us all the way. We'll know him. But uh, he was all man and all God. That's the wonderful thing about this is that he was all God, but yet he understood what you and I deal with, struggle with, have hard times with. He understands what it's like to live in flesh and bone. He understands everything that goes along with it. And that's a tremendous thing. We believe as Christians that he is the son of God, fully God, but yet while on this earth, human also, 
fully human to understand both sides of that now it says uh, also this last part of verse 4 he was made under the law Jesus didn't get special permission to come to earth and do what he wanted to do some people think that but if you'll look very carefully at Jesus' life he stuck strictly to the law of Moses as it was called he never once would break those laws unless it was uh, I, I, well, matter of fact I don't think he ever did you remember when he healed somebody what did he say go show yourself to the priest he would do everything according to the law he was made under the law that's important to know this because when you go through your Bible reading it you can't go into the gospels and get New Testament doctrine okay a lot of people do that they go to Matthew Mark Luke and John and they build church doctrine you can't do that because that's law okay he has not died yet what ushers in grace death the atoning death the blood sacrifice the blood of Christ had to be shed before grace would abound Jesus was born grew and lived and learned under the law he didn't he didn't have a special permission and that tells us you and I don't have special permission as Christians sure we're we're, we're not uh, bound by the law but that don't mean we just go do what we want to do you didn't see Jesus running around just uh, you know uh, smacking and doing things and saying well I don't care what God said I'm gonna do it my way now you see lots of lessons and you see things in there that uh, Jesus is teaching and showing but he didn't go around just doing what he wanted to do and as Christians we can't go around doing just what we want to do because Jesus knew who the ultimate authority was and it was God I know who my ultimate authority is I answer to him I live and, li and everything I am is through Christ not of yourselves lest any man should boast it's not me that lives but Christ that lives in me okay now this is what Paul is getting at here it takes me a whole message to say what he says in one verse that's good preaching amen now he's made under the law why verse 5 to redeem them that were under the law now he starts bringing you and I into this everybody else there you and I and, and all else the law of God has not been abolished we need to understand that the law of God still exists Jesus said I didn't come to do away with it I come to fulfill it he said, I didn't come to just look at all what God said he wants and expects and just say, forget it all. He said, I've come to administer grace. Now, what does that mean? That means that our judgment, when we stand before God, if we stand before God without Christ, you're going to be judged by the law. And by the law, you are guilty. And the law says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. You slaughter every goat in Arabia you can slaughter every chicken that, uh, that is in this county all the blood you want it's not going to be enough it takes the blood of Christ and you'll stand before him as redeemed redeemed means purchased when you, um, when you go to lay away it's Christmas time when you make that last payment and you go and collect that which you've paid for they call that redeeming it's you're redeeming your possession that's what Jesus did for us he purchased us he purchased our souls he purchased everything about us with his blood and uh, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons you didn't know you got a gift out of all this did you the Bible talks about Jesus being born they brought him gifts but there was a gift given to us too that through him we could be heirs, children of the Most High God. Now, being adopted, I'm not his blood son. Being a blood son would make me equal to Jesus. This does not teach equality with Christ. <laughs> this teaches adoption. This teaches a creature whose first father abandoned them, whose first father let them down. The first Adam failed us. Jesus said you're of your father the devil and we know what he's done you see they let us down but through Christ is the offer of adoption and you see if you go to a court today and you go and sit in on adoption proceedings you'll notice something that happens when they bring that child up for adoption proceedings they ask that child do you want to be adopted by this family that child has a say so whether they're small or teenage or, or even necessarily older do you want them to adopt you and that judge listens to that and that's the same choice we've got to make do you want God to adopt you do you want to be a child of God 
Seems like a silly question. But you wouldn't believe the people who say no. Who was it? Ted Turner said, uh, yeah, I believe in hell. That's where all my friends are, and I can't wait to meet them there. Heaven sounds like too boring of a place. There's a lot of people who know a lot about God. There's a lot of people that know about heaven. They don't want to go there. <laughs> There's a lot of people that's heard about Jesus. They don't want to listen. They don't want to submit. They don't care about their sins. They don't want that adoption. And I'll tell you one of the most heartbreaking things you'll see is when a child goes before the court with a family who has taken that child in, provided for it, loved it, gave it a chance, got it in school, got it healthy, bought it clothes, giving it a childhood, giving it everything. When that child stands before the judge and says no, and everybody says, what would make a child do that? It's a tie that's not yet been broken with the old father and with the old mother. You see, folks, we've got to let that die. You've got to understand something. The devil's trying to kill us, and he will kill us. And we've not done so good for ourselves because in the garden we messed it all up. And ever since then, he's been killing us. So I guess technically we've got a choice. Do you want to stay with an abusive father, an abusive family, an abusive situation, or do you want the arms of God wrapped around you to love you and hold you and caress you and bless you and help you? It seems so easy, doesn't it? But how many in this old world will this Christmas push away Jesus? What has America done? Well, you're starting to see some backtracking, but a few years ago we saw a tremendous assault on Jesus. You couldn't say Christmas anymore. A lot of places still don't say Christmas. The ones that do, they'll say Xmas. You've seen that? I didn't know what that was growing up. I just thought it was like, uh, you know, a short way of writing Christmas. And I found out later they're literally Xing <laughs> Christ out of Christmas. And it's intentional. It's not a shorthand trick. It's intentional. This world does not want to be adopted. This world does not want Jesus. We can go out and stand on the, the street corner and say, In the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, His Son made of a woman, to redeem. To redeem you, you, me, to die for us, to give us everything. And that we might, uh, verse 6, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit into your hearts, crying out. You can stand out on the corner and scream that to the top of your lungs. And until the Holy Ghost gets a hold of them, they're going to say, no, I don't want it. But what we need is verse 6, and because your sons, God has sent forth his Spirit. You can't have the Holy Ghost unless you're saved. <laughs> you cannot have the Holy Spirit living within you unless you're saved. But I'll tell you what, if we'll let the Holy Spirit of God, we talked about this before, have control, have his way, let the Spirit live in us, we'll cry out, Abba, Father. And you've heard this before, but to kind of bring it into vernacular of the day I have a father would be like saying daddy you know uh, I've seen some kids who call their dad's father and their mom mother something funny about that and if your kids call you that I'm not I'm not calling that bad but you've heard that hadn't you it seems real formal doesn't it when I was growing up it was mommy daddy mama I still call him daddy it's just it's a it's a term of endearment it's a term of association it's a term of a very close relationship and that's what Paul's getting at. If we'll become children of God through this tremendous gift he's given, we can call him Daddy. We can call him Abba Father. And that's the greatest relationship there is. You see, Christians, when we're praying, we're not in line praying to a God who's made appointment for us to talk to him. You wouldn't walk into the doctor's office and say, Hey, Daddy. <laughs> well, you might. But uh, you'd be on more medicine than you was when you came in. <laughs> you wouldn't walk into your lawyer's office and just wrap them up in a big old hug and kiss them on the cheek. You wouldn't do that, would you? Why? Because it's a professional environment. You've made an appointment. You've made a set time to meet with them. Don't treat God that way. Don't treat church like an appointment with God to get to come visit him, to get to come see him. Because if you treat it that way, you'll never come wrap your arms around him. If you treat it that way, you'll never come and say, Daddy, I need help. You'll never come and say, Daddy, I love you. You'll never come and do those things because it becomes formal. And that's what Christianity has become. It's become formal. God's an appointment to us. It's not a relationship anymore. Paul said it's a relationship. Abba, Father. It's not an appointment. Because if it's an appointment, we only got a few minutes. God, 
Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Lord, help me if you can. If you will, I'll see you. Bye. <laughs> that is not what God wants. God did not send Jesus and let him go through what he went through for us to treat it like that. It's a family. What's that old song? I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Have you ever watched Angie sing Child of the King? Next time she sings it, watch her. Somewhere through that song, you'll see Angie do this. <laughs> and it's not a tick. It's not anything. What happens, Angie's told me this. She said, when I sing that certain parts of that song, she'll get those little goose bumps. In church, we call them Holy Ghost bumps, goose pimples, whatever you want to call them. Because a feeling comes through her of recognition that I'm a child of the King. I don't come to church for formality. I come to church for family. I come here because he's my father. I come here because he's redeemed me. He's purchased me. He's given me everything. And this Christmas, I'm reminded God, in the fullness of time, <coughs> sent his son, born of a woman, to redeem me and to give me the opportunity to say, God, I'll accept your adoption. Jesus, I'll accept, and I want to be a part of your family. There ain't no stepbrothers and stepsisters, no adopted children in heaven. Jesus stands alone, stands above, and he should. But I'll tell you, when I get home, let me tell you where I'm going to go. I'm going to go to my Father. And I'm going to bow at his feet. And I'm going to thank him. I'm going to go find my big brother, Jesus. And I'm going to say, big brother, thanks for watching over me. Thanks for guiding me. Thanks for helping me. Sorry I was so stubborn. <laughs> Sorry I messed up. But thank you for never leaving me. And we're family. My big brother might wrap his arms around me and say, Hey, I forgave you before you ever did it. <laughs> I forgive you before you ever did it. I know you as a knucklehead. But come on home. We're home. What a day that's going to be, Kim. Amen? Amen. What a day that's going to be. This Christmas, remind yourself of these things fullness of time God sent forth his son born of a woman to do what only he could do made under the law to redeem them under the law that we might receive the adoptions of sons and because we're sons that don't mean just men that means women sons and daughters it's a term encompasses both God sent forth the spirit of in your hearts crying Abba Father that's who we've come to sing to that's who we've come to read about and next week when we wake up Christmas morning make sure that's who you talk to first Whatever else you do, whatever else you do, say, God, thank you. Well, preacher, we're not sure that Jesus was born on December the 25th. Shut up. <laughs> it's about recognizing that he was born. He could have been born on February 35th, for all we know. Who cares? Quit being like that. I believe that's what God say. Quit that. It's a day set aside to recognize that he came there's a lot of science that says it is that Jimmy said that before and that was good what you said that one time I forgot what it was obviously but you forgot it too but all <laughs> we're in the same boat Jimmy we just don't know where we're going <laughs> <laughs> but with all the stuff aside it's all about him it always has been let's let it always be let's stand together all tonight all of us that are able Let's stand together.